Yes, we're finally back. This week it's Kansas City Month in Review as we track the hottest headlines of the week and pick apart some of the stories we missed. From the airport to Washington, from Topeka to Jefferson City, informed you will be all the local news that matters next on KCPT. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. Thank you for coming back. Yes, it has been a while. The KCPT Winter Membership Drive is now over. I know instead of my little face in this time slot, you probably saw Engelbert Humperdinck, Peter, Paul and Mary, <laughs> or even Roy Orbison in black and white. This week we are back in vibrant full color and not skipping a beat are our news reviewers. He is Mr. Up to Date on KCYRFM star editorial writer Steve Kraske. And from KMBC 9 News, chief political correspondent Michael Mahoney. From 41 Action News, reporter Stephen Dial and the editorial page editor of your Kansas City star, Colleen Nelson. Believe it or not, the heartbreaking Kansas City Chiefs were not the only big story making news in our metro. A month ago, when we last did a program, there was turmoil, remember this, over the cost of the new terminal at KCI, and there was a squabble among the airlines over who would be footing the bill. Four weeks on, can you tell me, Stephen Dial, that the matter is now settled? No, no, it is uh, not. After Mike. all that time away? <laughs> okay. Right, big shock. Uh, Mike Mahoney and I were in a meeting just yesterday, and they gave an update saying the airlines still have not made an agreement on that baggage item. Now, people from the aviation department and Edgemore in the city are saying, look, this isn't an argument over the big pot of money. This is a small percentage. But nevertheless, when people hear about the squabbling and the back and forth, a lot of people are asking, will the airport ever be built? Should we be in a state of total panic as taxpayers and citizens? No, not, uh, not at all. Um, as, uh, uh, we were talking uh, just a second ago, um, the optics of this are not good, and they have not been good for a while, and that leads to the public skepticism uh, on this, and they should they should be skeptical about it. But uh, as Steve, as Steve is talk, uh, talking about, um, this baggage claim uh, situation is not resolved. The city is going to try to impose a compromise. Whether or not the airlines buy it or not remains to be seen. Um, they also are going to have a, uh, another second look on the cost of the airport. There was a meeting on that on Friday, and we should get that report early next week. And then the other thing is there is a debate about whether or not they're going to literally sort of scrape the couches for nickels and dimes to put together $48.8 million to start the, the bond sale process. Now, what's important about that is the pledge has always been we're not going to use general fund taxpayer money for this, except we're going to use it right now for just a little bit. I thought there was a dispute over that, that they still weren't going to use public money, though, uh, Colleen. They're thinking uh, that over because of the outcry of people saying, but you promised. And, and so, but I mean, this has been a more painful process than it should have been, but the airport is still going to be built. And, and they're absolutely right. This is a relatively minor blip. They're fighting over a $20 million baggage claim system in a $1.6 billion airport project. And part of the problem is they're still waiting for the final environmental sign off on this. And that delay has kind of given the airlines room to revisit the price tag and start haggling again. And meanwhile, the people who voted for this would just like to see some dirt flying. Steve. You know, Nick, Kansas City has a well-earned reputation for not doing anything easily, and that includes building this airport. Colleen's point is spot on. This is a $1.6 billion project. There's going to be questions and little squabbling over pots of money as we go along here, but there's no sign this project is in major jeopardy. Now, while the dispute lingers, the development team, Edgemoor, unveils an updated design look for this single terminal. How is it any different than what we've seen before, Stephen? Well, well, it's not really uh, that different. I think looking at it in a physical sense, you had that model there, and then we were talking about the renderings are, are actually really good. Seeing the actual arrivals and departures being on separate floors like most uh, modern airports, I think is a breath of fresh air to a lot of people. First off, first off Steve, you were exactly right, okay? Uh, secondly, <laughs> Thank you, uh, yeah. secondly um, it's interesting because Edgemore and their top management designer on this project, Jeff Stryker, says, yeah, what you saw on television, what you see in the newspaper, this is what it pretty much it's going to look like. 
On the other side, Mayor Sly James says, eh, let's not be held too tightly to this. This is a concept of a design, and maybe it'll, it'll change. I think what's important for Kansas Cityans is that this is another tangible look at what they can envision this airport to look like. And they made great pains to stress the fact that the parking garage is really close to the entrance, mm -hmm. and that meets their convenience goal. Now, it's now official that you are at least 25 years old, live in Kansas City, Missouri, have no felony convictions on your record, <laughs> and are up to date on your city taxes. You can be the next mayor of Kansas City. While we were busy raising money, the window opened for candidates to officially file for the office. You have until January. January 8th to do so. Rather than whittling down the number of people campaigning for the job, the pool of candidates expanded. Is it just a matter of time before some of these men and women drop out, or can we expect a double-digit pool of candidates running in the April primary, Steve? You know, I think we might see some comings and goings here, Nick, but I think what you have going on here, you're going to have a primary turnout of 50,000, 60,000 Kansas Cityans. There's a lot of mayoral candidate wannabes who think, hey, I can run up six, seven, eight thousand votes. I have that many friends in this community, so I can get into the two-candidate runoff. That's what's caused this field to blossom the way it has. Has there been any shift in the dynamics of this race, somebody really elevating in a big way or being um, downplayed in a big way in the last month, I, Michael Mahoney? I, uh, I think that there has been a change in the dynamic, and I, uh, I'll give you one example of this. I think that the re-entrance of Jolie Justice into this race uh, has not gone as smoothly as she she had hoped for. She ex was a, expected to be a front runner. She's still going to be a serious contender. But the fact that she was in and then backed out when Jason Kander got in and then got back in when Kander dropped out uh, has had, in at least some of the folks I'm talking to, well, is she is or is she ain't on this? And it's her, it, it's hurt her a little bit. Steve. Well, I think from talking to people in the community still with so many council members running and other people in the community, if you go down the street, if you go down Main Street or other parts of Kansas City and ask who's running for mayor, a lot of people still don't know. And these are people that hopefully these people elected to council and others. And one other thing that we haven't talked about since the episode that we talked about it, no one's talking about the Quentin Lucas arrest, uh, how, you know, people have a short-term memory. It's well, isn't that a great thing for him, then, isn't it, Steve? Oh, absolutely, and this is the holiday season, so let's do glass half full here, Nick. This is looking to be like a really quality uh, field of candidates here, terrific candidates. And I think this community is going to have a really robust conversation about where it wants to go in the post Sly James era. Once again, Steve, you are right. <laughs> um, and, uh, the, the other thing, Nick, uh, and the viewers need to remember, is the election is already underway. The voting is all already underway. And what I mean by that is in every political campaign, there is a pre-primary primary, and it's the money primary. And it is going to be the candidates that do the best job of raising funds for this. And this could be a million-dollar race, are the ones that we're going to see sustain into 2019. And so, uh, Back to the original premise of this, you know, are we going to see this big field? Yes, at first, but then that will winnow down as the money uh, starts to come in or not come in. Up next, here's a wintry scene of Cedar Crest, the governor's mansion in Topeka. Last month, Kansas voters picked a new governor. This is where Laura Kelly will live. The Topeka Democrat is now busy picking her staff and arranging her inauguration party. In fact, so busy, she turned down an invitation to the White House, where the president had invited newly elected governors from across the country for a bipartisan meeting to talk about issues on their mind. Given that the legislature in Kansas will be even more conservative than the year before, was this a missed opportunity by Kelly to show she's willing to work with Washington and across the political aisle, Colleen? It was not. It was a political calculation, to be sure, and but she's not going to be punished for not going to the White House. The fact of the matter is... Kansas Republicans are going to be tough to, for Kelly to work for on many issues, work with on many issues, regardless of whether she goes to the White House. And the the fact that she needs to deal with school funding right out of the gate, Kansas Republicans have already signal, signaled that they might want to start over, that they might make this really tough for Laura Kelly, uh, points to the fact that she has a lot of work to do and she needs to hit the ground running. And so she didn't go to D.C. and stayed here to work. Steve. You know, I think, yeah, the Republicans are already signaling, Nick, they're not going to be pushed over on any issue, including, as Colleen just said, school finance. This deal was sort of put together last session. Now Republicans are saying, to emphasize 
the point. They want to start this train all over again and run it down the tracks from the get-go. That's a step backward, I think, and it's a signal to her that they're not going to give her anything that she wants too easily. And this is a more conservative legislature than the one before, Stephen. Definitely, and uh, kind of picking back and off of uh, both who, who spoke earlier, is I don't think it hurts her from the standpoint of, yeah, optics next to the president, but she has so much to think about. And the, this quote from her spokesperson said that she's focused on setting a budget and saying that Kansas is in worse shape than she thought it would be. And so I think people forget the fact but that she's she busy working on an inauguration that she got a little bit of static mm -hmm. for this week, charging $10,000 a table. And, and the State Ethics Commission said no way on that. You couldn't even charge that much. That would be a violation of ethics rules. You know, I'm constantly amazed, and uh, I've been around this for, for a while, how much, um, how thorny the inauguration process gets for these uh, candidates. Yes. Um, it's, it, it's supposed to be the first step out, and you had a very good point earlier this week, Steve, when you were talking about the fact that her inauguration speech has to have a, a little flair to it. But, um, boy, you got to get this right, and it seems like politicians and their political inauguration committees always seem to screw this up or at least uh, raise some qu questions about it. And back to the other point, it doesn't look to me that Laura Kelly will have much of a honeymoon whatsoever. Uh, the school funding thing that we've just discussed is going to be an element. There's, she's going to have serious pushback on Medicaid expansion in the state of Missouri and the entire idea of reformatting and perhaps trying to expand government after the Brownback years is going to get a lot of pushback from a conservative legislature. You know, one of the things I just wrote about this, Nick, the new governors have so much to do, so much on their plate. They have to get the budget squared away. They have staff to hire. They've got uh, speeches to prepare. They have dances to dance to going in. And sometimes these issues like uh, don donors to inaugural committees get lost in the shuffle, and they can't afford to do that. They have to pay attention to detail after detail on a, all manner of issues going into office. Now, I should point out, though, there will be one less Republican member of the Senate in Kansas starting in January as Johnson County Senator Barbara Bollier announces she's quitting the Republican Party and will become a Democrat. The party has left me. I haven't changed myself. Senate President Susan Weigel downplayed Bollier's party switch, claiming she had a voting record more liberal than some Democrats. The only surprise she added was she didn't end her facade of being a Republican sooner. So what difference, if any, will this make, Colleen? Well, she alone won't make a huge difference because Republicans will still have super majorities in the legislature. And, and so it's not as if this is going to tip the balance of power. But the question is, is she the only one who's going to do this? And, and Steve wrote an excellent column about the fact that some other Republicans are contemplating making the switch as well, including Dinah Sykes, a state senator, Stephanie Clayton. Some other Republicans are, are contemplating whether there's really a place for moderate Republicans in this party. Now, I'm going to leave it to our viewers to decide how excellent that column really was. They <laughs> have a very different verdict. But you did indicate there may be others who may be thinking of a switch, too. Yeah, Steve. absolutely. There might be several. And you're really looking at the potential for a sea change in Kansas politics if there is a mass exodus of any kind here. For so many years, it's been conservative Republicans, moderate Republicans, and Democrats. That if the moderates go away, that changes the dynamics of Kansas politics for a long time to come. Well, last month, you voted to clean up government in Missouri by overwhelmingly approving Amendment 1 that set new campaign cash and gift limits in Missouri changed the way legislative districts are drawn and tightened the rules on lawmakers serving in office one minute and then becoming a lobbyist the next. Now the impact is already being felt. At least three state lawmakers resigning their seats before the lobbyist changes go into effect. So this really does have an impact. It's already scaring politicians in Missouri, Michael? Yeah, there's some concern about it. And uh, the reason this is happening now is because way back on December the 6th is when the law, the amendment of Clean Missouri, Amendment 1, actually took effect. And uh, that is why you saw several members, including Kevin Corlew from uh, north of the river here, resign uh, their, their seats early because uh, they may want to come back and be, and be lobbyists or try to go down to Jeff and and work their former colleagues. Uh, the campaign uh, limitations also kicked in, in, into effect. I suspect that this idea about the restrictions on, on, on lobbyists will have uh, an impact, but it's going to be really inside baseball. For example, there are a lot of people that go down to Jefferson City or Topeka, any state capital, and work on a staff with an idea of trying to 
eventually get into a lobbyist position or a government uh, affairs position, that's going to be a little uh, a little risky. I was actually surprised by all these uh, resignations because I thought weren't Republican leaders going to try and repeal this amendment and it wouldn't even go into effect in the first place? Well, they're talking about that, yeah. Nick, but that's going to be a really hard pull okay. for them because this thing just passed with big numbers. Going against that would be a tough political feat. And just to uh, add on to that excellent point by Steve, that was the fact that um, uh, the, the real heavy lift here isn't going to happen for a couple of years. And that's when this redistricting plan that is inside of this takes effect after the 2020 census. And that is what Republicans are most concerned about because they do feel that it would be Democratic gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the ethics reform is there now, but the big fight will come on redistricting after the 2020 census. Now, speaking of an exodus of politicians, Missouri U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill heading for the exit doors. She makes her final speech on the Senate floor this week and delivers an unflattering and damning portrait of life on Capitol Hill. Peter Morgan, an author, said no family is complete without an embarrassing uncle. We have too many embarrassing uncles in the United States Senate. Lots of embarrassing stuff. The United States Senate is no longer the world's greatest deliberative body. And everybody needs to quit saying it. Okay, Michael Mahoney, you spoke with the senator at length in Washington this week. She tells the St. Louis Post-Dispatch she will never run for elected office again. Did she let on what she'll be doing now, though? Yes and no. Okay. Uh, there's a big announcement that's forthcoming that I'm not at liberty to, uh, to talk about publicly yet. But she will, uh, she did say that she might... Uh, uh, be linking up with the University of Missouri and the School of Journalism in a political journalism uh, aspect of that. She will also be, uh, short, uh, for at least the near time future, still a major voice in Missouri Democratic politics in terms of uh, talking to different people and talking up certain uh, certain people. And then the other thing that uh, I came away with uh, from this was she acknowledges that Missouri is Trump country. And that that was something that was out of her uh, out of her play. But she is to go back to this crazy uncle uh, theme for a second. Very very critical about the majority leader Mitch McConnell, who says uh, she says that all all the legislation is written in his office and to some lesser degree the minority office, and then it's simply laid out on the table. And sometimes the lobbyists in Washington know more about the details of the bills than the senators do when they get them. Now, there are other big names in our region who are also exiting uh, their place uh, either in Topeka or in Washington or Jefferson City. What happened to Chris Kobach? Are we any the wiser today, Colleen uh, Nelson, as to whether he will get a prime plum job in Washington with the Trump administration? It's looking less and less likely that he's going to get a plum job with the Trump administration in Washington. There was certainly some buzz right after the election and, and some, some talk that he at least was being mentioned as a possible attorney general for President Trump. And, and somehow that cooled off and, the, and Trump appeared to sour on the idea. And there was talk that the president doesn't like a loser. And <laughs> as much as he's like, Chris Kobach. In the past, he doesn't like the fact that he lost. And, and so I think it's still very possible that Kobach will land in the Trump administration, but it doesn't seem likely that he's going to have a cabinet level job or be as high profile. What about outgoing Kansas Congressman Kevin Yoder? Do we have a better sense today as to what's going to happen to him? Well, I talked to him on the tarmac uh, when President Trump was here. Didn't know this, that he was going to be there, and uh, a lot of some people didn't uh, think that he would be there to greet the president. Finally, it was safe for him to be with the president. <laughs> right, okay. he, he was next to him. Um, and I talked to him, and he said right now he's just kind of focused on family. Of course, it was a big hit to him, and the media could definitely tell when he spoke to the media after losing to Sharice Davis. And I think he, in my opinion, I think he's going to take some time to look back and uh, readjust some things, but he could be back. I don't think this is it for him or it for him trying. Next up on the program, a sweetheart deal or a win for Wyandotte, why a lake house and the KCK police chief are now at the center of a messy political dispute. I like it out there. I bike ride, I fish, I kayak. I mean, it's a, it's a relaxing place to be with all the stresses and headaches that I deal with. Some asking this week, why is KCK Police Chief Terry Ziegler now living virtually rent-free at a lake home owned by Wyandotte County? The police chief struck a handshake deal to fix up the place in exchange for paying rent. Mayor David Alvey is angry at all the negative press the arrangement is getting. He says the house sat vacant for nine years and was in a state of deterioration. He says the deal allows the property to be improved at minimal expense to taxpayers. 
So if that's the case, who is really losing out on this arrangement, Steve Kresge? Well, there's a lot of truth to that, Nick. The problem here is a matter of optics. The unified government kept this matter secret for more than half a year. It took a citizen, Janice Witt, a former candidate for mayor, that's who uh, the new mayor was, was referring to. She came forward and asked for information about this. But whenever you have a top city official who makes a lot of money getting a, a, an arrangement like this outside of the public purview, that's going to raise issues with reporters and the public, and that's exactly what happened But here. she claims, though, um, or the mayor of David Alvey, this is a political hatchet job. This is just people who are just upset uh, with the way the change of administration in Wyandotte County. Yeah, but uh, to, to Steve's point here is it doesn't pass the smell test, all right? Uh, I think if they would have done this up front when Ziegler got the job yes. and, and said, Here's the deal, okay? Here's what he's going to do. He's going to fix the place up. We're going to charge him rent, blah, 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 blah. People will go, okay, sounds, sounds fair. Kansas City, Missouri has uh, city-owned residences where employees live in them. Uh, they're not sweetheart deals, uh, but nobody threw a flag on that because it, it, it had been out there. It was the fact that this had to be drug into the sunshine that's the biggest problem. Colleen. I thought the police chief's quote was was entertaining. He said, you know, it's really relaxing out here. And I think all of us would be relaxed if we could live virtually rent free. And this pro this deal has several different problems. As, as Michael noted, this was not transparent. This was a, a secretive deal. Only th There was nothing in writing until someone started asking questions. Only after someone started asking questions did they even put this down. And I think a lot of people were surprised to learn that the unified government owns a house or owns any houses, and I think people are wondering, why should the county be in the business of yes. being a landlord? But don't other governments own houses, including in Kansas City, Missouri? Right. That's true. And I think this is the, uh, to piggyback off of Michael Mahoney, this is the Steve is Right show, uh, the, the transparency in it of if it wasn't that big of a deal from the mayor's standpoint or anyone else's standpoint, then why didn't people know? If it wasn't that serious and we issue. aren't doing anything yep. wrong, then why didn't people know? And I think if they just would have been up front, it would have... Maybe some people might have been critical, but not as much as what the, the backlash is. It made. certainly wouldn't be discussed on this show. <laughs> All right. Well, Seriously. over in Kansas City, Missouri, there is a messy dispute going on of another kind. And I'm not talking about the airport. One of the biggest items on Mayor Sly James's bucket lists is now in serious jeopardy as the Kansas City Public School District announces this week it will not support the mayor's plans for a pre-K tax slated for the April ballot. These adult problems can be worked out, but when the adult problems become the focus, the kids get lost, and it's all about money and control and all these other things. Remember that plans by the mayor to provide subsidized pre-K through a sales tax was already ditched from the November ballot because of disagreements with school leaders. What is the sticking point here? Uh, I think the sticking point is the fact that the, the school districts believe that they should have a bigger dog in this fight than what they do. And um, just the tone of the mayor's soundbite that we just watched a second ago, I think speaks volumes. He does not care for pushback <laughs> in this nature whatsoever. And you could see it in his voice, or you could hear it in his voice. And uh, the school districts believe this is, uh, I, I'm sure that conceptually they like it. I'm, in fact, I'm positive of that. But they want to, they think this is their dog, and they, w and they want to continue to own it. They are the educators. They also don't like the fact that this goes to private educators yeah. and also to parochial educators. They want the money only to go to public schools. But the mayor says more than half of the kids in the boundaries of Kansas City, Missouri, are going to little private daycare centers now. The school districts are concerned about this whole idea of vouchers, uh, Nick, and it, this all strikes me as just oh so disappointing. I mean, everyone can agree on this idea of the importance of pre-K education, at least most people can. And here we are pushing forward with a plan and it's getting bogged down in politics over who controls this plan? Where's the money going to go? You know, the, the school superintendents say there's a five-member board who's going to run this thing. They get one vote of the five. The mayor gets to pick three members of the five, and therein lies this fight over power and control. Is this project, this whole proposal for pre-K dead now, then? It's not dead, and at this point, it's still on the April ballot, which is... Uh, uh 
potentially At problematic. At the same time, we'll be voting for candidates for mayor. <laughs> right, yes. exactly. And so, um, and the mayor certainly has signaled that he's willing, perfectly willing to go forward with or without the support of school superintendents. And from the very beginning, the mayor has been willing to go at this alone. He, this was his idea. He brought it forward without really getting buy-in from the school districts. They convinced him to delay putting this on the November ballot and, and, and have some conversations with them. But he still has not really wanted to bend too much to some of their concerns. Yeah. And the other difficulty here, Nick, is, of course, that a tax is a tax is a tax. And when it comes to Kansas City and its sales tax, there's very little room, and I don't think there's very much voter appetite for it. And it would be critical for him to have the school districts on board to sell that in their communities. And that's not the case right now. And finally this week, after recording more than 100,000 rides, the electric scooter company Lime is suspending service in Kansas City. The company, which made its local debut three months ago, has informed the city that they are halting service to take stock of how the business is doing here. Is this about not wanting to be on the streets during the frigid winter months, or is there more of an issue at play here, Stephen Dial? Well, when Lime made their announcement on 18th and Vine, I asked one of the Lime representatives, um, hey, what do you guys do during the winter? And they said, Oh, in cities like Milwaukee and other places, uh, people still ride them in the cold after the snow, after the sidewalks are shoveled. And so now it looks really weird that they are pulling their uh, scooters off the streets now that it is cold. Uh, I've been talking to multiple people at my station. They joke and call me the scooter uh, correspondent. Uh, and so s multiple things. Some people may think. You shouldn't oh, have said that out loud. You really shouldn't have. <laughs> Some people That's think be doing now. Bird, yes. Bird may have gotten here quicker, and so maybe they have more loyalty and Lime wasn't getting as much business. Others uh, speculate that uh, Lime was having some battery issues uh, out west with scooters catching on fire. That never happened here. But so a lot of people questioning why they're leaving. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from KNBC 9 News, Michael Mahoney, and from your Kansas City star, Colleen Nelson. You can listen to the star, Steve Kraske, weekday mornings at 11 on Up to Date on KCUR-FM, and KCBT's and Kansas City's scooter correspondent from 41 Action News, <laughs> Stephen Dial. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.